Okay, thanks, Franz. Uh, <coughs> you have heard already a lot about uh, detection, uh, about, about the, the, the clinical relevance, about the image processing. Uh, the missing part is still, as Franz said, uh, uh, how you combine these information, how you condense it, what is the classification. So since the final results of, of, of um, Dvarikas and Peter's research has already been cited several times, I decided not to bore you with these details uh, and only briefly talk about it, but uh, to sneak in some, some, um, some two slides actually, which we presented uh, recently with the president of ETH uh, on the issue of big data and in particular big data in medicine. And I think this project is a very nice project uh, highlighting this, uh, this importance. Uh, you have very heterogeneous data sources. So I think uh, in this area, you, you go from, uh, uh, from these genetic data to time series data in, in metabolomics uh, to tissue data uh, on very different scales. Here this is uh, uh, diffusion tensor imaging data of the brain and so on. But you also get, apart from these measurements, you get these uh, <coughs> diagnostic, prognostic, and therapeutic data of physicians. And yes, you have all these security issues, uh, uh, since I was not so sure about uh, what kind of data I actually can show. Uh, this is, these are medical records from myself, and I was assuming that at least uh, <laughs> this information from my cardiologist is owned to, to some degree by myself, too. Uh, I also paid for it, so. Um, but but I, I don't want to trivialize these types of, of issues, storage, security, and so on. Uh, the point I want to make is, before you want to secure some information, you should know what to do with it. And if you look at these raw data, to a large extent, we don't know how to interpret these data. So we definitely need much more of these types of data, uh, protocoling what the, what, the, what the physicians are doing, uh, what the doctor's assessment is, uh, have this in a very systematic way so that it's comparable and so on. These are the critical issues. Here we have, as I just uh, learned, petabytes of data. Here we have quite often actually uh, small sample size type situations. So either we learn without knowledge of the doctors from raw data what kind of conclusions we should draw, which I don't believe uh, is feasible, and, and since I was working in unsupervised learning for a very long time, I, I, I'm getting, maybe I'm getting older, but I'm also getting less optimistic. So, so we definitely need this additional type of assessment from the doctors. Now, the second stage is you have all these data management issues, storage. Here you have a huge data bank. We should have much more uh, uh, <coughs> data banks on, on the different type of samples which we take so that you can even look at these data years later when you have a better understanding. You have these, these cloud uh, services and uh, the, the, the enormous uh, um <coughs> amount of, of information systems, these information systems which are necessary to bring together the information. And then, I think here we, we have a fairly developed uh, uh, and sophisticated technology where we really have a problem is in data analytics. What do we do with all these data? How do we interpret them? And how do we bring them together with a, with a, with a quite often very complicated, not understood uh, um, a physical picture of the disease patterns, uh, of the pathways broken and so on? I think this is very important. And at the end of the day, this matters. Very simple quality standards, whether you make progress or not. Uh, the, 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 the slides were built on, on a study which we conducted with, physiolog uh, with uh, pathologists at, ETA, uh, at, at the University Hospital in Zurich uh, um, for renal clear cell carcinoma. So it's a cancer, um, <coughs> a very deadly cancer. And survival probability is to a large degree an unquestioned um, um, target value which you want to which you want to protocol which you want to uh, analyze and where you want to actually distinguish different patient groups so this is the prognostically good one this is the prognostically bad one uh, but you might have something else but survival maybe life quality uh, and not only life uh, time and so on I think in order to make progress for patients 
on these types of measures, we need much more data in this pipeline uh, uh, when we come up finally to this summarization. So let me come back to, let me come back to, um, what is this? Uh, okay, apparently my slides are too high up. Uh, achievements in CD detection in, in, in the Vigo++ Plus Plus, uh, project. <coughs> we had a two-step classification. First, you detect the regions uh, where the information is, is, um, uh, can be found, and then you segment uh, the Crohn's disease with your positive regions of interest. And then there is a whole bunch of different features which you want to uh, explore. Uh, in various experiments of, of, of these type of systems building, uh, inventing a lot of different features, sometimes even hundreds of thousands of features, and then filter one out those features out, which really give you the discriminative power. That was a strategy which worked quite well. Here, most of the features were actually uh, still handcrafted or at least motivated by insights from the from the, from the domain experts, shape, asymmetry, texture, uh, spatial context, uh, higher order statistics, and so on. Uh, and the other, the other direction in which we pushed the research was uh, uh, on semi-supervised um, uh, Crohn's disease uh, detection. Uh, semi-supervised in that context means to save the time of, uh, of the domain experts, the physicians, and don't bore them with uh, clear-cut cases. Uh, uh, draw their expertise from the from the complicated ones, and here you see these these regions of interest. So that's the pipeline. You have a test image. You do the your super voxel segmentation in the pre-processing classification comes. Then you use your random forest, uh, uh, um, <coughs> a very um, powerful classification technique, uh, which which has extremely good results in 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 these medical applications. And then uh, at the final stage, you get your final segmentation, uh, clean it up with state-of-the-art technology. You see the boxes here. So, so that was the full pipeline. And now you have uh, the big question to actually assess when you are unsatisfied with the results at the very end, which of the boxes can you blame? So how is, where, where do you, what is the weakest link in this processing pipeline? And I should also say we have very little systematic approaches in computer science to blame individual algorithms for the final poor outcome. If you, if you remember the original uh, 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 <coughs> setting where I go from terabytes of information to basically a kilobyte of survival information, I want to know which of are the critical bits in this whole pipeline which I'm not supposed to screw up. Which are these bits which make a difference at the very end for the patient? And a lot, most of these bits in the input don't really matter. They tell you all kinds of things, but not necessarily uh, uh, something about the survival probability. So when you, when you ask for all the information, so FSL means uh, a fully supervised learning. You have uh, uh, labels for all the data. That's what you get. You can treat it sort of as a gold standard. But uh, we should also say exhaustively doing that on all the measurements you have is impossible. You, you don't have the time of the physicians. So what you want to do is go for semi-supervised learning or go for active learning. And in semi-supervised learning, you actually are satisfied with a, with a few labels. And you use the, the information in the unlabeled samples to give you sort of a better density uh, estimation of your features. You don't really know how, to, how, to, how, how, how they should be labeled, but they give you additional information uh, together with your, with, your, with your labels. And active learning is that you, that you query the physician on those cases which are unclear. So, so filter out the interesting cases which are most informative. I should also emphasize, in this context, active learning would mean Give me the samples where, where, where the algorithm believes it carries most information about the final outcome, the survival probability, the disease status, and, and whatever is, is interested for the, uh, for the patient and for, the, for, the, for those involved. So the pipeline for semi-supervised uh, 
Um, <coughs> learning and active learning, uh, this, base, uh, this pipeline goes from the supervoxel segmentation uh, to the inter initial um, uh, selection of patches and then uh, the uh, volume of interest detection here. And then uh, you, you look more in detail, uh, filter out this initial patch selection, and then you can do all your, all your um, uh, analysis with uh, extracting the features. Uh, here you have the segmentation of the diseased regions, and then you, then you get this information which you finally want to, to feed into the classifier. So how well is it doing? Here you have some detailed information. Uh, if, you, uh, <coughs> if you go from SSL-AL, uh, you have the highest uh, dice metric uh, value. Larger is better. This is an accepted uh, measure of, uh, of segmentation quality in this domain. Uh, uh <coughs> active learning gives you this value. Fully supervised learning gives you this one here. And what you see is even if you use even if you use the doctor's information on all the samples which, which have been annotated in this case, uh, you still get not the, the large uh, diasmetric value which you would get from semi-supervised learning and active learning. So properly combining this type of information and actually also saving the time of the doctors um, uh, helps you to get a better result here, at least for this type of experiment on this cohort and so on. So uh, we are fairly confident that these uh, also, technical uh, novelties in this context make a difference uh, for practice. So here again, um, <coughs> a comparison of uh, uh, 12, patient number 12. Uh, you see the, from the different point here again, SSAL uh, has the highest diasmetric uh, compared to the other cases. So quantitatively, if you want to bring it together, uh, <coughs> 92.1 is the value for the dice metric here. You have the, um, the standard deviation and it, uh, it significantly differs from, from these other approaches. So this is something which has been developed uh, uh, in, in my group together with the project partners at other sites um, uh, for, for CD, um, for, for, for Crohn's disease analysis, and it, it pays off in, in this context here. Here is a list of, of, of the advantages uh, of semi-supervised and uh, uh, active learning. Uh, you save time. Um, I, I most of the time, for example, here you have only half of the manual annotations which are necessary. Um, future work is certainly also going in the direction whether we can strengthen these criteria so that we need even less um, uh, information from the doctors. And uh, it also cuts on time, so uh, we should not um, underestimate that the doctor who has uh, to spend an hour on these types of annotations doesn't have a constant performance from the first to the last minute. Uh, you know, it's going down as it's usual for everybody, uh, also for doctors. Um, <coughs> here what we have is um, uh, achievement, it says achievement in severity um, estimation. Again, uh, <coughs> uh, we want to, to um, um, predict the correlation to CDIS since this is the gold standard. Um, what we realized is that we are beating um, uh, the, the comparison st uh, standard, Maria. And uh, this is the pipeline. You look at these, at these uh, 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 image regions, then you detect uh, um, uh <coughs> You, you find these, these pieces of information, and then you do a local estimate of the disease severity, and then you can uh, put it on, on this graph and give the numbers for the different segments in order to make the, the, the comparison and to, to finally come up with, uh, uh, with, with the number you care about. So uh <coughs> what is the task? To predict CDIS uh, with MRI features. Uh, so that was not very clear that uh, for, for all parts of the, of the, of the project, but uh, in the sense of a replacement technology, it would be nice if the MRI features uh, basically give you um, uh, replacement information for CDIS. Um, you have this training and validation data of 30 patients. Uh, <coughs> here are the computational features uh, which have been added. 
uh, here you have the ball th thickness, which turns out to be important, uh, and these uh, contrast enhancement. And then we have also test data, uh, prospective ones, where we can check whether we are actually overfitting, despite the fact that we do cross uh, validation, whether we overfitting to peculiarities of this cohort. And uh, now comes the part which you have seen already. Um, <coughs> what Peter has, has looked at in his PhD thesis is 131,000 uh, uh, models uh, of the different uh, combinations of features which are available. You rank them all according to their uh, cross-validation performance. Uh, here you see you see the top performing models, uh, they are statistically indistinguishable. We took the, ten, uh, the thousand best models. And then now you can do some statistics uh, of what kind of features these models actually use. And so this might be a short, these five different features might be a short cert certificate of what characterizes the disease because they are particularly <coughs> important when you, do this, when you do this prediction. Uh, uh, when you try to mimic the correlation to CVIS. So this is the top five model, and then you can uh, compare. You have seen already this, um, uh, these summary statistics. Random gives you basically very bad results. It's completely off the chart. Uh, <coughs> this was the, the, the comparison with Mariah, so at least we should, have, we, we should be able to beat this one here. CDA is slightly better. Uh, this is the, 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 the top five model, so what we get out of, of, of the exhaustive search over the space of all possible classifiers, and when you then add these novel features to it, you get even a little bit higher. And what is important is uh, uh, from here to here you have 0.2 improvement. What is still a little bit um, uh, disappointing is when you now go to the uh, prospective data, you get the same difference between the two models, uh, Mariah and the best model which we have uh, uh, um, in the Vigo project, sort of distilled out of this data set, but the absolute numbers are much lower. So somehow we should understand, at least in the rest of the project, or if that's not possible later on, uh, why we are now around 0. Point, what is it? It's now around 0.5, and it was 0. Point, uh, above, uh, close to 0. 0.7. So, so we, we, we are significantly uh, poor of fitting uh, the CDIS on these uh, uh, prospective data, and somehow the, the classifiers seem to be sensitive to some influence of this cohort, which does not hold for the next, uh, uh, for, for the next batch of patients. So I think this has to be worked out. Uh, uh, quite often, uh, they, they are very simple explanations why you get such a big uh, um, uh, difference. Uh, hopefully, this will be also the case in, 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 in this study. But sometimes, it's just the whole setup, and you have to go back to the, to the, to the drawing board and, and go over the books of all the different steps in your pipeline. Uh, that is also, from my point of view as a, as, a, as a computer scientist and data analyst, the very interesting part. Uh, it's open for these types of projects where you have a sequence of processing chains to go from, from a huge volume in the beginning to, to, to a very few bits at the very end about the, uh, the question you are asking. Uh, where do you actually lose the performance? What is the systems design? What is the weakest link in this processing pipeline? And uh, I think we made some progress uh, within the framework of this project, but this is clearly an open question which we should answer at one point. Here you have the, 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 the correlations, and they are significantly higher um, uh, for, for, for the model than for the comparisons. So let me summarize. Conclusion and future work. Uh, Crohn's disease detection, I think active learning and supervised, uh, semi-supervised learning um, uh, pay off, uh, so the development of the slightly more sophisticated techniques, although I should emphasize both are hot topics in machine learning these days. Um, uh, <coughs> in, this in the context of this uh, project, uh, uh, they, they were beneficial. Uh, 
uh, we have to explore what the potential for clinical use is. Uh, I think there has to be significantly more studies be done. Uh, CDI, uh, uh, CDIS regression in terms of a, of a replacement technology, I think we made some progress and future work is uh, we have to also check whether we can, we can uh, uh, improve the whole computation, but I think we need much more validation on, 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 on new patients. And uh, let me let me add this. This morning I read um, I read from Kahneman uh, um, sort of the, an advocate. He's an advocate of these simple rules, and the simple rules which go according to standardized procedures uh, in very complex domains with a lot of uncertainty seem to be the way to go. And in some sense, that's exactly what we, what we mimic with these uh, uh, machine learning techniques in collaboration with the doctors. The machine learning techniques, after the doctors did the annotation, provide you with the simple rules. And these, uh, these classifiers with the, simple, with, the, with the feature weighting, maybe even the equal feature weighting, uh, uh, they are these, these, these rules which, p which prove not only in the medical domain to be very successful, they apparently seem to work when you predict the prices of Bordeaux wines as well as whether uh, in recruiting soldiers they actually do it then a decent job when it comes to combat uh, or whether you recruit students and whether they get a, a degree in the end uh, uh, from your university. So just to, to let you know uh, from the publications, uh, we have a whole bunch of publications uh, on the different uh, questions which we studied here so scientifically I think we, we paid our dues and with that I like to close. Thank you. <laughs>